All right, thank you so much. And let's see, right, there we go. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you, Shannon, for the, the introduction here. We're so glad that we're able to see all of you, sort of, at least we can see your names on our uh, registration list here and, and know that you're um, joining us for these webinars. We've had a lot of fun exploring all these different topics uh, since early April uh, when everything changed for us. So anyways, welcome to our webinar for today. And uh, sh let's see, that one is not, let's see. There we go, okay. So Shannon did a great job of giving you a little uh, real quick nutshell about STWF and who we are and what we do. And uh, just to give you a little personal information too here, these are my three children. Uh, Ellie is 16 now, she's the one uh, practicing archery there. Uh, Lauren, looking for birds, she's 14. And my son Evan is 10. Uh, enjoying some fishing there. So they're a big part of, of course, my life and but also in uh, my reasons for uh, wanting to conserve our natural resources and our wildlife so that they will still be able to enjoy it as, when they grow up as well. But so they just kind of, for me, that's a very personal reason, but for everything that we do, uh, you know, they just kind of represent all the all of the children, our future generations, and really what we are uh, working to protect for for them in the future. So, just wanted to uh, give you guys a little uh, personal information there too, and kind of our you know what we're really uh, working for here. Uh, this this presentation and and several others this uh, this fall will be sponsored by the Outdoor Fund at Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. They typically sponsor our women's outdoor retreat that we have every fall, and we had to cancel that this year, unfortunately. So uh, they've agreed to move their sponsorship to our webinar program instead. So uh, definitely are very very grateful for their support as well. So just, uh, just real quickly about some of our other education programs. Uh, we are the host site for the Midlands Master Naturalist Program. Master Naturalist is a statewide program and we are one of six host sites across the state. And so we get to visit lots of these natural areas that I'm going to tell you about today uh, with the Master Naturalist Program. And so we have a training every year in the spring and uh, includes uh, 12 days of training with expert guides. Um, this uh, picture here shows Austin Jenkins um, who helps to coordinate the program in the Midlands and leads a lot of the, uh, a lot of our classes. We have other, several other great guides as well. And we also have our Palmetto Pro Birder program that's similar to Master Naturalist, but it's just focusing on birds, identifying birds by sight and by sound. And these are held all over the state. And so we really get to visit a lot of amazing places. So these two programs together uh, have visited a lot of the places that I'm going to tell you about today. And so you'll see in some of the pictures, groups of people, um, and they're mostly from from our programs and from uh, photographs that some of our participants have taken as well. So as, as Shannon mentioned, we also have an advocacy side to our organization and uh, this picture at the State House was our group along with several other groups that are part of the South Carolina Conservation Coalition. So we really work together with lots of uh, other organizations to affect uh, conservation in South Carolina. And uh, we're really uh, the main one that's really focused on wildlife specifically, uh, even uh, game animals uh, for hunters and fishermen. So, um, so, you know, you will hear about some of the, those activities that we're involved in as well. 
So we really work to protect wildlife across the whole state. And we always say, you know, we all say from the mountains to the sea, and there's so many amazing places in between as well. South Carolina is very um, just blessed to have all of these different types of landform regions and especially uh, compressed into a small state that's very drivable, very accessible. And so by having these different types of landforms all in our state, we really have a great diversity of different wildlife and different amazing places that we can visit. And they're, they're very different because of these uh, different landform regions, different soil types, and so they support different communities of plants. And then, of course, they attract different types of wildlife as well. So we will be talking today about uh, natural areas all across our state. And the handout that Shannon mentioned, it gives you a lot more information about lots of these places. And if you didn't get the email, we'll send it out again uh, afterwards so that you're sure to have this information. But on the last page of that handout is the map that's on the screen right now. And so it has, I've added little numbers in, in boxes all across the, the map there that coordinate with the uh, different locations uh, throughout the handout. So you can really get a good idea of where all of these places are in relation to each other. So I've picked different locations. There's so many wonderful places, but I've picked locations uh, because of one of these, at least one of these uh, different categories. Could be wildlife abundance or some unique wildlife feature special plants, accessibility, uh, and also outdoor recreation. Some of them have more than one of those, but uh, really tried to focus in on ones that have uh, some, some sort of really unique wildlife or plant uh, community there. So before you visit, uh, with, in your handout, there's websites for all of these places. And as of yesterday, all of those websites were current, accurate, and working links. So hopefully uh, those will take you to the right place. Um, having that handout electronically from Shannon should let you just click on the links uh, to access more information about each place. But uh, check those websites for their hours of operation, any closure dates. Some of these places might close for different seasons or hunting days or different things and you don't want to go when they're having a hunt there. Uh, so, and another thing is that I, none of the information on the handout um, includes any COVID related updates. So be sure that you check the website for those because they, they may have some additional uh, different hours of operation or um, different regulations that you need to follow because of COVID. So be sure to check for that as well. Also, of course, anytime you go out into nature, some of these places are quite remote. So you really want to make sure that you're well prepared. And anytime that you go outdoors in South Carolina, especially in the spring and summer, make sure you take plenty of water to drink. Uh, heat exhaustion can come on really quickly and can really be very serious uh, if you're too far away from phone or an ambulance or whatever. So make sure that you really have plenty of water to drink, extra snacks, stuff like that. Uh, we also usually encourage uh, our participants on our trips to wear lightweight long pants, uh, even in the summertime, because it will protect you from insects like mosquitoes and chiggers and that kind of thing, uh, and also poison ivy. So just having those long, long pants, long sleeve shirt, hat, uh, will really help protect you. Also bug spray and sunscreen uh, make your, in, your trip a little more comfortable. And I also threw in there to make an extra pit stop along the way. You'll notice in, in, in the handout here that a lot of these places don't have restrooms available. So just thought I would throw that in just to make sure that uh, you're really well prepared to have a comfortable visit to these places. 
So also just some quick rules of the trail before we dive in here. Uh, staying on trails uh, in any of these places is really important for your safety. Uh, there could be snakes or other things, um, some poison ivy and stuff like that. Uh, but it also, a lot of these places have really sensitive plants, rare plants in some cases. Uh, we have ground nesting birds that, uh, that may have a nest somewhere that you're walking through. So just make sure that you stay on the trails. That's really important for your safety and also for our wildlife. Um, harassing wildlife is something, uh, you know, that can take a lot of different forms. Of course, you don't wanna poke a snake with a stick or approach an alligator or a bear or something like that. We all know that, uh, but in some places, um, your national parks, you can actually get a ticket for picking up any kind of wildlife, even if it's a butterfly or something like that. So you really want to just, um, uh, you know, avoid the temptation to, to pick up anything that you find and um, leave it be. So we also suggest not taking your dogs in some of these places. Uh, I mentioned the ground nesting birds and other, uh, you know, wildlife that, that are in those areas. Uh, if you do take a dog, make sure you keep it on a short leash, not longer than six feet, so that you can keep it on the trail with you and it can't wander uh, off and, and disturb the wildlife. Of course, you not, we encourage you not to dig up plants or even to take cuttings from different plants that you might wanna to try to root at home or that kind of thing. Um, and that's against the rules in a lot of these locations. So of course, we just encourage you to take only photographs and leave only footprints. That's a good rule of thumb. There are a couple uh, apps that you can use that, that may also enhance your experience. There are several different types of apps that will count your steps or They'll make a little map of your progress as you are walking through an area. So, so those are um, nice ones to use when you can. Um, and in some cases, if you, if you get turned around, uh, you might be able to use that mapping feature to help you retrace your steps and make sure that you get out safely also. iNaturalist is a really great app that will show you what other people have seen in that area, either plants or animals. And then you can also log your sightings as well. And geocaches are also located in several of these areas. And the picture there is a tiny little geocache. So you can go to geocaching.com and learn more about that. Um, but I just wanted to throw that out there as well. So there's lots of um, other ways uh, that you can um, just enhance your experience as well. So most of the places that I will talk about today are uh, public lands. The vast majority of them are public lands. And so they're, they're owned by all of us. And uh, there are some things that you can do uh, to really help these areas in managing for wildlife. If you buy a duck stamp, and you can do that through our website now or at any post office, uh, that goes back uh, to help preserve and uh, enhance habitat uh, at the, our national wildlife refuges. Buying a hunting license uh, for, through the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, whether you plan to hunt or not, it will help our DNR to be able to manage state lands uh, for wildlife. So those are two really important things uh, that you can uh, do to help some of these uh, public lands. And so, of course, we'll talk about many of these areas as we go through the list here. So in your handout, I have arranged these places in the order of the best time of year to visit um, for certain reasons. And so I'll talk about each of those as we go along here. Um, and then towards the end, there's some that just anytime is, is great to go. So starting in the wintertime, uh, going up to Lake Jocassee up in the upstate, 
Uh, this is one of our, um, one of the best water qualities in the state at Lake Jocasse. Devil's Fork State Park is located right on the shores of the lake and you can rent kayaks and that kind of thing right there at the park. And also in January and February, uh, you can see the loons on the lake and you can go on a pontoon tour with Jocasse Lake Tours and they will take you out to see the loons. They also do loon counts so that uh, they can contribute that data for citizen science um, programs as well and help uh, wildlife biologists really uh, research and learn more about our loon populations. On the other end of the state, along the beach, Huntington Beach State Park is a great time, is a great place to visit any time of year. A lot of people don't know that winter is really a great time to go birding. Uh, it's especially great for shorebirds. We have a lot of um, winter birds here that we don't have at other times of the year. And with the, with the leaves falling from the trees um, or have, have head fall, uh, fell from the trees, um, it's easier to see a lot of birds sometimes. So it's a really great time to go to Huntington Beach. And uh, on their website, they have a list of all of the birds that have been seen at the park. And you can also see it's a chart. And so you can look by month and see which birds have been seen there during that month. So whenever you go, you can see, look and see what you're likely to see there. Or if there's a certain bird that you're really hoping to see, you can look at that chart and see uh, when is the uh, most likely time that it will be there. So that's a great feature about that park as well. Of course, there's alligators and loggerhead sea turtles that nest on the beaches and a lot of other coastal wildlife, uh, but it's a, definitely a birding hotspot. Another birding hotspot in the, Ace, the whole Ace Basin, uh, which is a, an area uh, that is protected. It's where the Ashapu, Combahee, and Edisto rivers come together and it's a huge wildlife um, haven in South Carolina. It's between uh, Charleston and Beaufort and um, Bear Island Wildlife Management Area is uh, managed by the D Department of Natural Resources. And this is a great place that you can go and there's a road system through there. So you can drive your car through and you can really see a lot of wildlife right from your car. So if you have limited mobility or whatever, uh, you, can, you can just stay in your car the whole time if you'd like to, air conditioning. <laughs> um, I have uh, this on here for February. Um, they are closed in the winter time, but right after they open up is a great time. I mentioned um, that uh, winter is a great time for birds, shorebirds, there's a bald eagle hunting in this picture here. The wood stork up in the top picture um, is, is a threatened species that we have, and there's lots of them there as well. Um, in February, uh, white pelicans like these do also maybe see uh, tundra swans. And so I've uh, put, the, put a description in your handout here of exactly uh, the impoundment that we've seen them at before, or the pond that we've seen them at before. So you can take a look there right at sunrise and uh, maybe see the tundra swans as well. So that's a really neat experience and you can hear them honking. Uh, and it's just, it's an incredible experience if you're able to see that. All right, getting into the spring a little bit. Of course, there's lots of amazing areas of our state that have a great wildflower show in the spring. Stevens Creek Heritage Preserve is one that's especially known for their wildflowers and um, right next to the trail. So uh, in your handout, there's basically step-by-step -step instructions of from the parking lot where you go to really see the best wildflowers. Uh, it's especially important here to stay on the trail because a lot of these are really tiny delicate little flowers and uh, you don't want to uh, risk stomping on them um, if you leave the trail. 
So, uh, so this is another uh, amazing place to try to visit to see the wildflowers, especially. 40 Acre Rock Heritage Preserve is one of my favorite places to go. And we go here with Master Naturalist every year. Um, we were gonna to try to have a women's hike up there this year. Hopefully next spring we can do that as well. Um, and so this is, um, it's a large granite outcropping that has these small depressions in it. And in the springtime, those depressions are full of water and typically, and they have tiny, tiny, tiny little plants that are very well adapted to those little uh, ponds that are in the rock and some that only grow in those types of environments. And so you just really, this is a, the top picture is a close up picture of some of the, just the variety of different tiny little plants that you're able to see. And just for a little perspective, so you can see how big the area is with people, that's our master naturalist class there, <clears throat> um, learning about the different uh, plants that are there in the ponds. And you can see that there's a great view also off the, the edge of that outcropping. Um, there's also, technically, it's a waterfall that you can visit. Um, it, it's a little hike down from the, the top of the rock there. And it's a little bit more strenuous just to walk out to the, the big outcropping with the depressions. It's a very easy walk on an old road, um, very flat terrain. Down to the waterfall or little water trickle, I guess, um, is, is a little bit more maybe moderate hiking. Um, but it's a really neat area. There's a lot of amazing trails at that preserve as well. There's a um, old beaver pond and lots of different types of um, places that you can explore. But the, the depressions on the top of the rock is what really attracts people to that area. Peachtree Rock is another uh, DNR heritage preserve and this one's located um, near the Columbia Airports in Lexington County. And uh, it's named for this rock formation that you can see at the top here that kind of looks like a peach tree, I guess, um, and was formed at, with years and years and years of erosion. And um, so for perspective, well, a couple of years ago, it, it toppled over, unfortunately, but uh, you can see in the bottom picture there now, um, it laying on its side and has a big crack in it. Um, but you can see the man standing there too to just realize how big that, tr that rock really is. Um, and that's Wayne Grooms. He a, was a volunteer extraordinaire uh, who was an absolute expert on Peachtree Rock and knew everything about that whole preserve and passed away a few years ago. So he, he's greatly missed. Um, but Peachtree Rock also has a waterfall, the only waterfall um, in the Midlands, the only natural waterfall in the Midlands. So that's also, you know, depending on the time of year that you go, also a very um, slow little bit of water that comes through there. Um, but I put that in the spring because near in the area near the rock, um, there's a lot of, um, mountain laurel that blooms there in the spring and it's just beautiful to see that. There's lots of ferns in the rocks uh, around that waterfall area and Carolina allspice, lots of other things that are blooming in that area that really make it amazing in the spring. <clears throat> also, um, there are parts of the preserve that are very open, very sandy, um, really sand hills habitat. And um, they can be cr crazy hot in the summertime. So going in the spring, you'll, you'll catch the blooms and won't be um, as hot also, of course. This is a blueberry also on the left here that, that blooms on the property. So uh, a really amazing place to go um, and explore. Now, this is what a waterfall, <laughs> when I think of waterfalls, this is a waterfall. 
So this is a it's a Station Cove call Falls up at Oconee Station historic site up in the mountains up towards the mountains, and um, so per for perspective on this one, that's my husband standing down there with my two children um, several years ago, two of my children. And um, so you can see, you know, that's really a spectacular waterfall. You can get, get close to it. Uh, the rocks are quite slippery, of course, but, um, but it has a really easy walking trail from the parking lot. My son was probably five at the time. Even now at 10, he doesn't, do really long hikes so we have to find short little hikes um and he was was you know really good with that trail it was a really easy one for him too so um and all along the trail on the way out there are beautiful plants there's may apple all across the forest floor um there's also these trillium that are in the bottom right and so that's why i put uh this place um in the spring because the, the trillium will be blooming there um, late April. You might be able to catch the trillium blooming and that's, that's a really neat thing to see. Um, Jack in the pulpit plants that are up there as well. Also in the spring, you have a better chance of having a good water flow over that waterfall. So it's a good, good time to go visit up there. Um, Carolina Sandhills National Wildlife Refuge. This is one of the places that benefits when you buy a duck stamp. And um, so this, this is run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and they manage this land specifically for the endangered red cockaded woodpecker, which you can see here on your screen. And they have to have uh, longleaf pine forests and those forests are managed by fire, prescribed fire. So it's a very, um, it takes a lot of intense management for that species. Um, so this is a great place. Um, I mentioned about the Ace Basin being a, a place that you could drive through. Carolina Sandhills is also that way. You can see a lot of great things even from the road, from your car. Um, if you go in the spring, I put um, late April, early May, uh, there's some, blooming plants that you'll be able to see. Um, <clears throat> these, this top left, there's a um, pitcher plants in this area called the seepage. And I put, the, put that on your handout also. If you ask at the visitor center, they'll be able to direct you to this area that's, that's um, very boggy. And so it has some of these carnivorous plants in it, like this pitcher plant. And so this traps uh, insects and then digests them and uses that for its food food source. And they, a lot of these carnivorous plants start blooming during this time period. So this area known as the seepage will just be covered um, with these yellow blooms of these carnivorous plants. So that's a really neat thing to see. Um, and also in the spring, the woodpeckers will be, um, well, they will have babies in the nest. And so they'll be actively going out to find food and coming back to their nest cavities. And <clears throat> as you drive through the refuge, um, you can see there'll be trees that have a white band painted on them, um, usually about six feet off the ground or so, there's this white band. And those are how the refuge staff identify the, the trees that have nesting cavities in them for the red cockaded woodpeckers. So as you're driving through um, they are an endangered species, so you cannot get too close to them, but from the road uh, with good binoculars, you can look for those trees and then you'll be able to watch for the birds as well. And you might be able to see them coming back and forth um, from that tree. So that's a great uh, opportunity to see an endangered species there. And at the visitor center, you can really learn about how they're managing the land for that endangered species. Congree Bluffs is another heritage preserve, and this is right across the river from Congree National Park, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but in the spring, this is a wonderful place uh, to really do a lot of great birding. And it's located up on some higher bluffs that you can see there. And um, so there's an observation deck 
that you can go and look over the tops of the trees of Congaree National Park. So it's a really uh, unique kind of viewpoint uh, for the park. And there's a lot of great birding there as well. So um, we've seen all different kinds of warblers there. We've taken our pro birder classes and master naturalist classes there. Um, you get indigo buntings like crazy. We've seen painted buntings there before. Um, all, we get water birds and that kind of thing too. Um, so just a lot of really great uh, birds that you can see there at Congaree Bluffs and it's pretty easy walking. The Carolina Bays are a rather unique uh, landform that we have in South Carolina. They're also found in North Carolina and some other, um, they're called different things in other places of the world, but we have um, several of them that you can see from aerial photos like this, or even Google Earth, if you go um, and look in like the Ori um, area, Ori County area on Google Earth. And they're there are these oval shaped depressions and usually very boggy areas and they have sand uh, pushed up at, at the, um, the one end there. So there's, there's lots of mystery kind of surrounding Carolina Bays and we actually had a webinar on this earlier in the year. And so you can go to our YouTube channel and, and learn a lot from Austin Jenkins about Carolina Bays. Um, but you can go to Lewis Ocean Bay Heritage Preserve <clears throat> and, um, and visit a Carolina Bay. So there's some, um, some characteristics kind of of different Carolina Bays there on your screen. And they do have a lot of carnivorous plants, especially at Lewis Ocean Bay Heritage Preserve. So the pitcher plants in the bottom, like I mentioned, um, and also Venus flytraps that you can see there another carnivorous plant that grows here in South Carolina. Another wonderful plant, uh, Lansford Canal State Park has the endangered Rocky Shoals spider lilies. And there are some place, other places um, around the state where you can see them also. There's some that you can see from um, the highway in Columbia on the Congaree River. Um, and but Lansford Canal State Park really has the biggest show of them um, that I've seen and so there's a real easy walk from the parking lot and I put in here um, to go in May and they also usually have a lily fest so um, it's a quite crowded on those days but you can go anytime in May and see um, see these gorgeous blooms. A real easy walk, like I said, from the parking lot. Parking lot. You'll go down along the river and then there's an overlook uh, that you can see um, just, just thousands of them out, out in the water. So uh, it's a really unique looking plant. There's a closer up picture in the top right there, um, but just a really beautiful, um, beautiful thing to see and uh, a great uh, easy walk for that one too. <clears throat> of course, I have to talk about the wonderful Congaree National Park and they have a great boardwalk system. Um, so it's really easy walking on the boardwalk and um, really accessible for lots of people. Uh, you can uh, have a short walk there on the boardwalk and then there's a big expanse of trails also that are down, um, not boardwalked, but um, so lots of different ways to explore Congaree. Um, there's also areas where you can put in kayaks and that kind of thing. So uh, it's a great place to explore. They have champion size trees or some of them are um, champions because of their age and different aspects of them. but. Um, so just some amazing huge trees that you can see right from the boardwalk, um, right close to some of the trails. Uh, and I put it during the, the summer um, in June because of the, um, the fireflies that they have. They have um, the synchronized fireflies at Congaree. And so it's a great time to visit and see the fireflies out there at night. And um, so, but any time of year is great out at Congaree. 
Um, make sure you take your water, make sure you take bug spray. They actually have a mosquito meter on uh, at the visitor center so you you know what to expect before you get out into the, the swamp. So, um, but just a fantastic place to visit. Uh, of course, we have the loggerhead sea turtles that um, nest in South Carolina. We, there's a few other species that occasionally nest in South Carolina, but these are the most regular nesters <clears throat> in our state. So any of our beaches are a great place to be able to see them. Uh, they are threatened and so very strictly protected with the Endangered Species Act. So you absolutely cannot touch them. You cannot take or just dis can't disturb any nests or anything like that. Take any eggshells, nothing like that. Um, very heavy fines for doing that. Um, but some other things that you can do to really help them is keep your lights off at your beach house. Uh, if you're staying there for a week or whatever, or if you're just walking on the beach, keep your flashlight off. Um, they, they come up at night to nest and the hatchlings will emerge from the nest at night and they need dark, dark, dark beaches to be able to get to the ocean safely. That helps protect them from predators also. Um, but they navigate based on light. So they need to be able to see the ocean. Um, so also filling in holes, a lot of kids like to dig big holes at the beach, which is fine, but then fill them in and also remove all, your, all of your stuff so that the hatchlings can have a clear path to the water and so that the mom that's coming in to nest um, cannot get caught up in your beach chairs or whatever also. So, Shannon, questions? Yeah, we do have a question. This one actually goes back to um, Congaree. Um, there was a question that said, um, they missed the time of year for the fireflies and wanted to know when that was. Um, and we haven't had a ton of other questions. Most people are just commenting, saying they've enjoyed a few of these visits and are excited learning about new parks, so. Yeah, okay, great. Um, at, for the fireflies, it's mid to late May and um, where they're, when they're synchronized. They're there other times, but they seem to do their synchronization at that time. Um, and you can check their website and they, they have it, you know, um, they'll tell you when the fireflies are starting and they have certain visitation times and that kind of thing. Yeah, there's generally a lottery to get in to see the fireflies so always just make sure you're checking that website um i know unfortunately they did cancel the viewings this year due to covid but hopefully next year yeah several of these things have gotten canceled this year so like Lil lily fest i think probably um also and some of the other actual events that are associated and viewing opportunities so um okay i think um so I mentioned in your handout with the sea turtles, um, <clears throat> they, they start nesting in May and they finish nesting kind of early August, typically the, when the females come up um, and the hatchlings will start uh, hatching out kind of mid in July really and go through August. So if you go in July, you might have opportunity to see both the adults and the hatchlings. And a lot of these, the beaches, a lot of our state parks have programs to see the, to, you know, go look for the sea turtles. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the private beaches like Fripp and um, Harbor Island and some, a lot of them have um, volunteer groups that, that will help to protect the sea turtle nests. So, um, so there's different types of opportunities to, to see them and to help out. <clears throat> on Lake Murray, there is an island in the middle of the lake. Um, lake Murray's in this, the middle of our state, and there's an island um, called Bomb Island uh, where they used to um, use it for target practice back in the day um, with, with their, from the bombers. Um, but anyways, uh, now it's a Purple Martin sanctuary, and the Purple Martins will come um, usually late June through early August, um, and they roost 
on this island after they're done um, with their nesting and raising their chicks, they will all come and roost on this island while they get ready for their migration and they migrate down to South America. But they, for a, a good solid month here in the middle of the state, will have thousands and thousands and thousands of purple martins that come to this island. So as you can see, boats will come out to this island and just hang out out there at sunset and watch the purple martins come in. And it's an amazing thing to see. Um, the website that I put on your handout uh, gives you information if you want to rent a boat or um, there's also some like sightseeing tours that, where they'll take you out to see the purple martins. But um, <clears throat> so that's a really uh, another amazing thing to be able to witness as well. Kind of along the same lines, not as not as big of numbers, but the swallowtail kites and also Mississippi kites um, will congregate in these fields in Allendale um, in the summer. And so it's also in July um, through mid-August. And these, these fields are private property, so you can't go walking out through there. But from the road, um, you'll see probably a lot of other birders that have stopped along the sides of the roads and um, just to be able to witness all of these kites. And uh, they are just circling through the air uh, looking for June bugs. So um, that's, that's um, another amazing thing to be able to see and um, just witness this kind of spectacle. Speaking of spectacles, this question does go back to the Purple Martins at um, Bomb Island. Um, they wanted, Dennis wanted to know if they nest in natural cavities or natural nesting sites or if there are artificial nesting sites provided. Um, well, the Purple Martins, the eastern population of Purple Martins have just adapted, I guess, over the years to only nesting in um, human made uh, structures. So sometimes it's those condos that you see that look like a big birdhouse, but there's lots of little holes in them. Um, they also will nest in gourd birdhouses uh, that people hang up a lot of times. So, <clears throat> um, so they, they really look for those, those types of um, nesting places. However, they're not nesting on Bomb Island. This after they nest, they nest in other places. And then after their nesting is done and they're raising their chicks, that's all done. They're preparing for their migration. So they come and all roost together on this um, island in Lake Murray at that point. And then Vina asked, um, do you have to have a special permit to go visit that private island where all the Purple Martins are? Um, you don't have to have a permit, um, but you cannot go on the island. You can just go, and if you know somebody that has a boat on Lake Murray, they'll probably know how to get to Bomb Island, and they'll, you, you know, anybody can go out there, um, but you just cannot get off the boat and onto the island. It's a preserve uh, uh, specifically for the Purple Martins. Yeah, perfect. And we did have a webinar, I guess it's been a month or so ago now, um, that we called the Spectacles of South Carolina, um, where our bird guy, Jay, um, talked about uh, the purple martins and also the swallowtail kites. And um, then um, we had special guests from Congaree National Park that talked about the fireflies. So. Um, check, you can check out that. Uh, that one, unfortunately, we had technical difficulties with the recording. So that one okay. is not on our website. Sad. We'll have to do that one again. <laughs> yeah, we will. We will. That's and the also, one that is missing. Yes. If you check out Instagram, a lot of the really beautiful wildlife shots that we post, probably one a week, um, come from Zach Steinhauser. And um, if you if you check out his Instagram, he um, is working on a documentary about the Purple Martins. So you can find a lot of specifically Purple Martin content on his um, Instagram. Yes, absolutely. He has a lot of great, great photographs. 
Um, so uh, another bird related one um, is the hawk migration that you can see from Caesars Head State Park. And on their website, they say from September through November. Um, I've heard of the most numbers of them in September, um, but uh, you can, there's an overlook area here. This is uh, Ranger Tim Lee, um, and he actually helps to teach the Upstate Master Naturals program too, just as an aside. Um, but he's an absolute expert on that park and in the, the hawks also. And uh, so you can go and they have all different uh, educational programs there um, about the, the hawk migration, but they, they'll just have all different types of hawks that that is their path for their migration route. So they will pass by that park and they do count, citizen science counts for the hawks at that park as well. Twin Falls, this is another fantastic waterfall. Um, this is in Pickens County and um, it has the two waterfalls, one that's really steep and one that's more of a cascading um, down the side. But this is another one that's a super easy walk for little kids um, or anybody with mobility issues. Um, I took my uh, girls, I think Lauren was maybe three, so it was a super easy walk. And there's an observation deck, which is where this picture was taken from, um, that's real safe for kids and everything. So, uh, so this is a really great, great one to be able to see very easily. Some of our waterfalls are not as accessible, um, but these are a couple that are really, um, really great and real easy to see, especially for kids. Botanical garden in Clemson. So now we're in getting into kind of um, places that any time of year is really great to go. Um, Botanical Garden at Clemson is wonderful. They have some more formalized gardens as well as just uh, miles of nature trails that you can, you can go and walk. And they also have, I say new, a relatively new um, heritage trail that will take you from the mountains to the sea in a very short little walk. And so you can see they brought in uh, soil from the different parts of the state so that they could grow plants from the different parts of the state. So they have in the mountains, they have plants that are more situated um, for the mountain soils and mountain habitat. And then you can walk actually through the state and see plants that are you typically find the Midlands and plants that you would typically find on the coast. And so you can really see a great, um, the diversity of different plant life that we have across the state right in a short little walk that's really easy um, at the Botanical Garden there. So they have a children's garden also and um, lots to explore there. <clears throat> Lake Conestee Nature Preserve um, is right outside of downtown Greenville and lots of really accessible trails with boardwalks and you can see here there's some educational signs and kiosks that kind of thing uh, so it's a really great place to explore really great for birding um, they have a, a long bird list um, they've seen some really kind of rare birds that have passed through there and it's amazing that it's just right outside of the downtown green hole and it's this amazing nature area there. Goodall State Park, it looks like Goodale State Park, but anybody that you know from the area, they call it Goodall. Um, so it's right outside of Camden, just east of Camden, and um, they have this beautiful lake area here with pond cypress trees growing. There's uh, carnivorous plants growing along the, the, sh the shore there. And I put this one in there, especially, it's beautiful and there's short little walking trails that are real easy, um, but they also have a paddling trail and you can rent uh, canoes and kayaks there at the, the ranger station. And they have a marked um, <clears throat> uh, paddling trail that you can um, go, it's th three miles, um, it's flat water. So they put it as moderately difficult because there's not like a current that helps you uh, with your paddling, um, but it's it's a very easy uh, paddle otherwise. Um, and so that's that's a, a unique feature of this park. 
Calmia Gardens is located in Hartsville. This is another place that has some more formal gardens and then also some beautiful nature trails right there along Black Creek. And uh, this is just a, you know, kind of a unique um, area, habitat area um, in that part of the state to be able to visit. Lynch's River County Park is, is just south of Florence and um, they have a lot of great things like they have a splash pad for the kids and they have an archery range and that kind of thing. Um, all, of course, hiking trails. And they also have this canopy walk um, where you can uh, kind of walk through the treetops and get a very different perspective and um, might be easier to see some of the birds um, during the, you know, when, when the birds are around um, so that you can be more at their level. Um, so just a unique uh, feature that this park has. Berkeley County Blue Ways. Um, Blue Ways are just waterways. And so this organization has created a list of 23 different paddling trails, kind of like Goodall has, but uh, these are just all different types of trails that are through um, in Berkeley County. So Lake Marion, Lake Moultrie, the Santee River, um, all those really um, just beautiful, full of wildlife areas. And so they have these different paddling trails. Their website, if you go to that website, it's very detailed and it tells you where you can put your kayak in, um, how long, where, exactly where to paddle, how long it'll take, how difficult it is. There are some places along those blue ways where you can camp and either paddle back out the next day or go a little bit further and camp. And so uh, just all different types of trails for all different um, adventure levels. Uh, so it's just a really uh, unique and amazing um, opportunity to explore those waterways in Berkeley County. And this is one um, area, a similar area down there. And this is a little bit less adventurous if you, if that sounds a little too much for you. Um, you can stay uh, at Santee State Park. We camped there during spring break a couple years ago. And then there's a Fish Eagle boat tour that leaves from Santee State Park and it's a big boat um, and they will take you out there, have super knowledgeable guides and um, I, I'm not sure how many osprey nests we saw on that little tour. It had to be at least 50. Um, there's just tons of them and it, so uh, if you go, so we went during spring break, so April timeframe, uh, you'll probably see lots of osprey on their nests. Uh, we saw an eagle nest while we were out there. Amazingly, we didn't see an alligator. Our guide says they see them all the time. Um, lots of turtles and that kind of, and hingas and lots of um, cormorants and other types of birds uh, that you would expect in those areas. But, um, but just, this is a little bit less adventurous, but you still get out, get out into the, um, the, the further reaches of the lake there. Watery Heritage Preserve, this is another uh, DNR property uh, that's uh, kind of between Columbia and Sumter. And uh, this is another area that's really drivable and there's a network of roads so you can drive through and see there's lots of fields that are open and really great for, for birding. Um, and you can also drive up to the top of Cook's Mountain. This is, this is a mountain for the Midlands and uh, overlook the river there. So it's a real neat uh, opportunity to, um, to, to visit that place as well. Botany Bay Plantation, this is down at Edisto Island and uh, you can go any, this is another one that's, that uh, has a driving loop. And so uh, you can just drive through and see lots of incredible scenery. Uh, they do have a, a beach that you can walk to, this beach here. And so from the parking lot, I think I, on the, your handout, I put a long walk. It's not like miles long, 
but it's not just right next to the parking lot either. So um, take, take your water and sunscreen and everything. Um, but uh, it's a completely pristine area and the beach is completely untouched. Um, and it's amazing because they don't allow you to take seashells out. So it's amazing all of the shells that you can see. Um, and so this is my daughter, this is Lauren, my middle one, um, kind of having a little bit of a hissy fit there because she loves to collect shells and she found this huge whelk shell and she couldn't take it with her. So she was, um, she was having a little bit of a tantrum there, but, um, but it, it's just an amazing place to explore. Of course, my son loved climbing on all those trees. So um, just another really um, neat place to see um, and visit. And just from the car, uh, as we were driving out, my son said, hey, there's flamingos. And of course, we don't have flamingos, but they were roseate spoonbills. And so that was, that, and that's um, a really amazing thing to be able to see as well. So um, that was one place that we, we saw roseate spoonbills. So I got to teach my son about the difference between flamingos and roseate spoonbills. They're pink, but there's, there's a little bit different. So um, anyway, so I can open it up to questions now. And um, I'd also like to, of course, um, reiterate what Shannon said earlier about our link for donations there and we will send it to you in the follow-up email as well but your uh, just just having your support joining us for these uh, is is wonderful and we greatly appreciate that we would absolutely appreciate financial support as well um, especially when we're having to cancel cancel all of our in-person classes when we get to see you guys um, but uh, you know we definitely hope to be able to do those again soon we're all crossing our fingers but um, in the meantime we'd absolutely appreciate your your financial support as well so um, we have questions Shannon yeah Greg wants to know if there's still boats going out to Bulls Island daily and I think is it coastal expeditions yes Yes, Coastal Expeditions does those. Um, last time I checked, which was in July, they were doing those. Um, but definitely check their website to make sure. Um, and they they were limiting the number of people, I think, and masks on out to the island and, and things like that. So, um, and I also put St. Philip's Island on the list here. I didn't get a chance on the handout. There's more places that I wanted to talk about, but I just, with time, I didn't get a chance, but they also take a ferry out to St. Philip's Island, which is a new part of Hunting Island State Park. So yeah. definitely check out their website. And, and to reiterate what Sarah said about checking websites, I mean, um, there are various reasons why some of these parks are closed. If you look at, um, Hunting Island, for example, with the effects of climate change and and rainwater there, they often have to close. So just always make sure you check their websites or their social media before uh, you plan your trip. Um, let's see, Susan wants to know where the best place to see a Rosette Spoonbill is. Well, I would absolutely um, suggest Botany Bay um, and um, also Huntington Beach State Park. I've heard a lot of people see them there. Um, I think those are the, the main ones that kind of jump out to me as being easy ones to get to where I know people have seen them. Um, so I think I would say those two would be my top picks. Yes. If anybody else has any suggestions, you want to <laughs> pop it in the chat box where you've seen them too, that'd be great. Um, and Will added about Bulls Ferry, um, just make sure you try and get those ferry reservations in advance. I know those are especially important for the St. Phillips Island tours as well. Right. Yeah. yeah absolutely. A lot of people- They're both popular destinations, so a lot of people want to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, lots of people commenting. Uh, Dave said Spoonbills are at Donnelly quite frequently, so- there you okay. go. The places to check out. I know today's not the best day for a road trip, but 
today's a good day to talk about taking a road trip and to plan exactly. a road trip. <laughs> exactly. But it's good for our, filling up our um, rivers and keeping our, our wildlife hydrated, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Days like today remind you the importance of planting native plants also since they yeah. can handle our weather a little bit better. Yes, and keeping our wetlands natural so they can help retain our, our waters. Exactly. All right, no more questions have come in, so I think we can wrap it up. All right, well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And as we mentioned, we recorded this, so we will send you the YouTube link and we'll send you, we can send the handout again just to make sure that you got it um, in a follow-up email. So thanks again for joining us. Hope to see you again soon at some of our other upcoming webinars, which you can see those listed on our website. And we're adding more as we speak. So yeah. stay tuned. And we did just have one last question come in. I just want to know if you can take a private boat to St. Phillips, and I believe the answer is no. Um, that is a tour specifically run through the state park system. So, um, and then I think Coastal Expeditions has permission to go there as well, but um, I would check with those two sites. Yeah, absolutely. All right, All thanks, right. Everyone. thanks everybody. Thanks Shannon for your help as well. Yeah, hey, you did a great job hosting. <laughs> we'll see everyone soon. Check our website for upcoming webinars. Bye-bye.